To avoid unwanted YouTube ads, we encourage you to watch this video via the link in the video description below. Good morning. Thanks for joining us at Awake Us Now as we continue our study of King David. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to pick up with the ongoing story of one of the saddest times in David's life. Would you join with me, please, Heavenly Father? Open our eyes to the truth. May we recognize your incredible love and faithfulness. May we respond to your gift of life and forgiveness by lives of sacrifice and obedience. May you be honored and glorified this day, and may each of us be encouraged and blessed. Amen. Well, we're going to continue with one of the saddest and most tragic accounts from David's life, and frankly, one of the saddest and most tragic accounts in the entire Old Testament scriptures. It is the story of David's adultery with Bathsheba and all that followed, which is a huge blot on his life, his memory, his record. And uh, as we start this morning, just a, a few words in order. We had discussed last week, rather briefly, some words written by David's son, Solomon. Solomon was also the son of Bathsheba. And he wrote these words, Proverbs 5, 20 and 21. Why my son be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. Solomon wrote that from a vantage point of being able to look back at what his father had done. It is also worth noting, however, that Solomon had some other things to say just prior to this, and I believe they are important for us to keep in mind. In the verses leading up to Proverbs 5, verses 20 and 21, Solomon makes the following comment. He invites individuals to rejoice in the bride of their youth. And he has some very explicit language about sex in marriage. And I think it's important for us to stress this right at the outset here, because even today, there are many people who are operating with the false assumption that the Bible condemns sex. That is not true. God invented it, and he said it was good. But God also limited it. He circumscribed it if I may use that term, by saying it is to be enjoyed in a covenant relationship by a man and a woman who have pledged their faithfulness to one another for life. When we move outside of that, that circumscription that God has established, it brings all sorts of difficulty, trial, and tragedy. And David is a classic example of that. Any individuals who have known the pain of being treated unfaithfully by a spouse know how, how devastating that is. And the scripture is very clear. God wants to protect us from devastation. He wants to bring joy and blessings into our lives. But when we move outside of his will and his purpose for us, it brings consequences, not just on us, not simply on our family, but on many others as well. And in David's case, on an entire nation. So on that note, let's pick up where we had left off last time. We had ended in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 5, when Bathsheba sent word to David, the only time she speaks in this account, and says, I am pregnant. It's at that point now that we continue. David is in his palace here in his city, the recently conquered city of Jerusalem that is now under Israelite control and is the capital of a unified nation. And it's at this point that David concocts a plan to try to cover up what he has done. You know, cover-ups are nothing new. We tend to think of that as political machinations that have happened in American history. But the fact of the matter is, it far predates American history. And here we have one of the classic attempts at a cover-up. A king who is all-powerful attempts to cover up what he has done, and the result is disastrous. This is what we read. Verse 6 
of 2 Samuel chapter 11. So David sent this word to Joab. Please remember, Joab is the commander-in-chief of the Israelite army. Joab is also David's nephew. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. So right now, David is thinking, I'm going to bring this soldier in from the field, one of my top commanders, one of the, the 30 who were recognized as the greatest warriors in all of ancient Israel. I'm going to bring him back to Jerusalem and we're going to cover things up. Verse 7, when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Now, if this seems a bit contrived, <laughs> it is. And you wonder what Uriah must have thought when, when David asks him, well, how's, how's the general doing? And uh, how are the soldiers getting along? And how's the war going? As though he had not been informed of those things before. Now, you can be assured that David, the consummate warrior, was in constant contact with Joab and others, desiring to know how is the campaign going. But now he brings home this one man, a noted warrior, and he asks him questions that quite honestly appear to be beyond his pay grade. Then David said to Uriah, verse 8, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uh, in other words, why don't you go home, rest a bit, you know, thanks for giving me an update on what's happening with the campaign and with your fellow warriors, and uh, I appreciate the, the information about my commander-in-chief. Why, why don't you go home and wash your feet? In other words, take it easy, sit back, enjoy life. By the way, many have pointed out that there may be a euphemism here. In Hebrew, in the, the Old Testament, a number of occasions, Wash your feet has very definite sexual connotations. David may be saying, why don't you go home and make love to your wife? And, and to uh, further encourage that, we read, so Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. Uh, maybe, a, a, you know, a bottle of wine and, and a nice meal, a couple of steaks to throw on the grill or something like that. But Uriah is having none of it. And so we read, as David is here in the city and he tells Uriah, why don't you head home and, you know, enjoy it? We read these words in verse 9. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. In other words, Uriah simply camped out with the troops at the entrance to the king's palace. Don't you wonder what the conversation was like that night? I, I'm sure there was, you know, the the normal conversation. So how are things going out in the field, Uriah? What's been happening? But gossip being what gossip is, and let's be frank here, you know, gossip comes even about things that aren't true. Do you think that the entire palace was unaware that the king had called a beautiful young woman to his place, spent the night with her and sent her back, and she just happened to be the wife of one of David's best warriors? Do you think that was unnoticed? Do you think no one said anything about that, or at least no one whispered it? It is very possible, particularly in light of what we are about to read, that Uriah got wind of what had happened. And it is certainly not implausible. We read this, verse 10. David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? And what is Uriah's response? I think it is very, very noteworthy. Uriah said to David, verse 11, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and to make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Please note, he doesn't say, I wouldn't do such a thing, your highness. 
He just says, as surely as you live talking to David, I will not do such a thing. (sighs) Again, we can't prove anything, but it is certainly a very real possibility. And as Uriah speaks that, He is reminding David of something that David himself had said years earlier and that was apparently part of the ethos of Israelite warriors under King David. What he's reminding him of, I believe, is something recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 4 to 5. You will recall in 1 Samuel chapter 21, when King David, long before he became king, was one of Saul's chief warriors and fled from his own home because Saul was going to kill him in his bed. David fled to the town of Nob, to Abimelech, the high priest. And he asked Abimelech for food and weapons. Abimelech was reluctant to do that. But this is what we read in 1 Samuel chapter 21. As David has asked for bread, we read in verse 4, But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept for us as usual whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? Apparently, under David's command, soldiers were required not to be intimate with their wives while they were on duty on carrying out their role as as warriors. And I believe what Uriah is doing right here is reminding David, hey, this is the policy, king. And I would just tell you, I will not do such a thing. Now, what does David do at that point? Does he fess up? Does he relent and repent? No, he just goes one step deeper into the cesspool. And so we read these words as David prepares to send Uriah back to the front. But first, he does this. Verse 12, then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. Uh, There is a tragic irony here as the king tries to get this warrior drunk so that he will do something he said he would not do, go against his conscience and his orders. And the tragic irony is this. Uriah has been fighting the Ammonites. How did the Ammonites come into existence? The answer is found in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we read the following. This is from Genesis chapter 29. uh, Genesis 19, excuse me. This is what we read. You will recall that the Lord had destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and that Lot and his two daughters escaped that fiery judgment. And then you will recall that they camped out in a cave, and the daughters began talking to one another and saying, you know, there aren't any men around here. How are we going to preserve our family line? And so the older daughter got her father drunk one night and laid with him and became pregnant. The next night, the younger daughter got him drunk and laid with him. And the scripture says Lot didn't remember a thing the next day. But this is what we are told in Genesis chapter 19, verse 38. The younger daughter had a son, and she named him Ben-Ami, which means son of my father or my father's son. 
He is the father of the Ammonites today. So the Ammonites came into being when daughter made her father drunk and committed adultery, uh, engaged in unlawful sexual activity. That's how the Ammonites came into being. And now David tries the same tactic that he probably knew from the Torah. Because from all we know about David's life, he was faithful to the Torah and familiar with its teachings. And David uses the same scheme that Lot's younger daughter used to end up bringing forth the very people that Uriah was now fighting against. There is a tragic irony here. But Uriah, although he has been made drunk by the king, does not go home. And so we read in verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. David now goes from adultery to cover up to complicity for murder. And it just gets worse. Note the instructions, would you? Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. Uh, looking at that, I think David is really losing it now. Up until this time, he has been very crafty. But at this point, he is doing something that no trained warrior would suggest. And that is, you send the troops up, but then everybody pulls back so that one guy dies. That's going to be so obvious. Everyone will know and talk about it. They'll be able to put two and two together. But David has lost his reason here. And he is simply trying to cover up what he has done at the expense of anyone. And so we read in the scriptures, verse 16. So while Joab had put the city under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. Now, do you realize what this is? As we read this text, and as David writes the letter and sent it with Uriah, Uriah is actually carrying his own death warrant. Now the question, did he know that? It is not beyond the realm of the possible that Uriah had put things together and figured out what had gone on here. It is not beyond the realm of the possible that Uriah knew this is not going to end well. But Uriah, a Hittite, is an Israelite of highest standing. And the king, who is the king of Israel, has debased himself to become as an unbeliever. Violating the commandments of God, the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not kill. Every one of them, David has violated here. And what starts out as one sin quickly multiplies and grows. And boy, dear friends, there is a lesson there. You know, it is easy to fall. We human beings are tempted. The scriptures are very open about that. The scriptures also tell us, as we saw last week, Paul to the Corinthians in his first letter, that with every temptation, God will provide a way of escape. But the danger is when we turn away from the escape path that God lies, lays before us, it is very easy not only to do what we knew to be wrong, but then to try, as David did, to cover it up with additional wrongdoing. And what we see here is just horrific and tragic. And so we read these words then. Verse 17. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. So the attack has been launched on the city that is modern-day Amman, Jordan. 
And as the Israelites draw near, the uh, enemy comes out. The city has been under siege, surrounded. The troops have stayed away, but now they move up toward it and the Ammonites come out to attack them. And it's in the midst of that that Uriah is killed. And so we read the following, verse 18. As the siege goes on here at Rabbah Ammon, we read this. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerob Besheth, or Jerubbabel? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone? on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Now, what is that all about? Well, what David is doing, or what Joab is doing with David here, is he is sending him code, and it's twofold code. The first code is to let him know that Uriah has died. But the other is to remind him from an event in Israel's history and uh, basically to say, King, I have some things over you. The event in Israel's history is recorded in the book of Judges, chapter 9. When we read the account, just as is mentioned here, of Abimelech, the son of Jerob Besheth, Jerubbabel, or also known as Gideon, when the uh, illegitimate son of Gideon attacked the city of Thebes, got up close to the wall, and a woman dropped a millstone on him that hit him in the head. And as he's dying, he asks one of his comrades, run me through so that they won't say a woman killed him. What Joab is doing is basically letting David know this is all coming about as the result of something done by a woman with you. <laughs> and, and it may well be one of those political notes to let him know, I have this on you. Uh, don't mess with me. Whatever the case, we read these words following. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Joab recognizes that the king's order to send the troops close to the wall and then pull back from Uriah is not going to be a good cover-up. And so he allows a, a substantial number of his troops to get close to the wall, and a number of them die as well. And then the messenger tells the king, and by the way, your servant Uriah the Hittite perished in the fight as well. And what is the king's reaction? Verse 25, David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. In other words, you know, there, every guy's got a bullet with his name on it. Uh, press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. And now we have gone from adultery to deceit to murder, multiple counts, and additional cover-up. In other words, encourage Joab. David wants to look good. He wants to look good in the eyes of this messenger. And by the way, you wonder, did Joab give the messenger more details than the messenger needed because Joab knew what had happened in previous years when a messenger came and gave David bad news, such as the death of Saul 
and the death of Saul's only surviving son? We don't know, but we do know this. David was absolutely duplicitous here, and it doesn't stop. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. We're not told how long that period of mourning was. We do know that in ancient Israel, when Moses and Aaron died, the mourning lasted for an entire lunar cycle, 28 days a month. Uh, the traditions that we know about in other cases would have suggested a seven-day period of mourning for a lesser figure than Moses or Aaron. And in all likelihood, Uriah's wife puts on widow's garments for a few days. And then we read this. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. I'm gonna raise one other issue here and one other very real possibility. After the time of mourning, David invites her to the palace and she becomes his wife. Is David trying to look good once again? Remember with Abigail, after the death of her husband Nabal, David took her as his wife. And we suggested that on the basis of what we see in scripture, he, he may have taken her as a kinsman redeemer, one who is going to provide a, 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 a descendant who will be able to care for her later on in life and fulfill the role that kinsmen redeemers were to, to take in Israel. It may be that David is pretending, I'm doing this out of the goodness of my heart. Here is this poor widow who has lost her husband and he's a Hittite, so probably doesn't have family nearby. And so I will take her in and, and father a son through her so that we can carry on the name of Uriah, her husband. And I'm doing this uh, because I am a, a devout follower of God and I recognize the importance of the kinsman redeemer's role. But this thing, we're told, displeased the Lord. And that sets us up for one of the boldest, most courageous acts of anyone recorded in the Hebrew Scriptures. Chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan was a prophet. In fact, was David's prophet. The Lord sent Nathan to David. Please note that Nathan does not go of his own free will and own accord. He goes because God says, go. And Nathan, we read, when he came to David, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. And at that point, we hear the beginning of one of the most amazing parables in all of the Bible. We think of Jesus as being the premier parable teller, a human story with a heavenly meaning. But Nathan is also one who tells a parable. And it cuts through all of the pretension, all of the lying, all of the cover-up and gets right to the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is the heart of the king. And that is where we need to stop today. We're gonna to pick up next week with a story of boldness and courage, a story of conviction, and praise God, a story of repentance. But it is also a story with a whole host of other consequences. On that note, let's pray, shall we? Lord our God, may we take these things to heart. We recognize these things are written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. May we in these last days walk before you in faithfulness, humility, and obedience May we follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, trusting him as our Messiah, our Savior, our Deliverer, and our coming King. And may we, through the power of your Holy Spirit, resist temptation, 
turn away from evil and walk faithfully and obediently before you. Amen.